You know, I'd just be thinking that John was reading my sermon notes. Amen, brother. <laughs> Confirmation here. All right, thank you both. The reason I say that is I received a text message this morning coming up on my start of my eighth year here as the full-time pastor, which all began in 2016. Yes, <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, the gentleman who served as at my installation formal um, commissioning service here at the church by a gentleman by the name of Bruce Jones, Dr. Bruce Jones, and uh, who's now with the Lord. And uh, Bruce left behind his wonderful wife, Beth Jones. And some of you may know Beth. I know my wife is, would probably say this is one of her best examples of a godly woman and a pastor's wife. And I believe my wife does her best to emulate a lot of what Beth Jones, who she uh, has been to so many women, uh, has been very influential with women's Bible studies. And so I feel like my, my Beth is a version of, as a little Beth of Beth. <laughs> but anyway, Beth reached out to me this morning and she says, praying our mighty God covers you, your family, and church today as you open God's word. May the Holy Spirit move in your heart and message in the congregation. The enemy is defeated, is a defeated foe, and the blood of Jesus, his son, covers you and his people this day. We are in such a final important days. We are in final we are such in final important days and you have been called and equipped for such a time as this. Wow. That's a that's life's breath from a pastor's wife uh, in Jesus Christ. So, thank you Beth. And I just want to um, for a couple minutes get your minds to think about where we're heading today. It is likely at some point that we've all taken some form of public transportation such as the MBTA subway, right? <laughs> Looks familiar. Sometimes we're like, don't like that thing anymore. Um, one of the things that most people look forward to when entering the train is, is either a seat or something to hold on to, correct? There's nothing, especially when that train is full, right? So here you go. And there is nothing more unsettling to have n um, nothing to hold on to when something is uh, either suddenly stops fast um, and you say something like this to the guy you're now sitting on his lap. Hey, nice to meet you, Mr. Stranger. You on the T? You want to be Facebook friends, you know? And sometimes these events even happen that we've heard about. You can go to the next slide. Yikes, that's a bad day if you weren't holding on. Um, and it can be very disruptive, and that's why sometimes you see all these people like walking off into off of these, you know, nearby these, and they're just getting out of there. I just got to get off that train. That thing just totally, you know, freaked me out and upset me. It went off the rails. We've been hearing all about train derailments, more cargo freight trains these days. But anyway, this probably has to be one of the most unnerving feelings to go through is when you're traveling on a public subway and you have nothing to hold on to. And literally, you can feel the momentum of that, you know, that car just, it, you, you just feel your body and sometimes you bump into people. But to have those handles to hold on to make all the difference. Amen? You know it, right? You know, and maybe you turn this opportunity into witnessing when you finally fall on that guy's lap and you say, this train is bound for glory, this train, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, d don't carry nothing but the righteous and the holy, this train is bound for glory. So you can use any and every opportunity to win people to Jesus Christ, right? Okay. And that's a lot of what we're going to head today. Trevor had mentioned that in the Sunday school, a little bit about the Church of Philadelphia. And I want you to know this morning that uh, when we, we've been told by Jesus in three of these, uh, we've already really looked at five of these specific addresses. Today we're going to look at number six. And uh, Jesus says that he who reads, um, keeps, and understands the words of this prophecy will be blessed. So there's a unique blessing added to understanding the book of Revelation. We met at men's group earlier in the week on Wednesday mornings, as Paul mentioned, and I mentioned that, you know, at least some of the stats will tell you that 65% of pastors won't teach on Bible prophecy. Somebody said there that it's even higher than that. I believe that's probably true. It's interesting that the one book that promises a blessing, if we would read it, understand it, and keep it, uh, why, why would we ignore that? It seems that Satan would want to be behind 
people from seeing that his future is completely doomed, right? Our future is completely glorious. Those of us who believed on the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and somehow in this tension, you and I are placed, and the scripture calls this the good fight. We are fighting the good fight of faith. I believe the Lord Jesus gives the church himself holy handles. Jesus is the holy handles that you and I are to hold on to. He is the one, no matter how much life shakes, how much the train's going to derail, he is the one, he is the friend, the scripture says, that will stick closer than a brother. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. In the th- In three of the six addresses, again, we're going to look at the sixth one today, our resurrected Lord Jesus uses the phrase, hold fast. What does that mean? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. I said to my wife on the way out the door this morning, I'm not looking to the right, I'm not looking to the left, I'm not looking behind me, I'm staying fixed on him. And I say that to her because sometimes some of the conversations that she and I have, especially in these recent weeks, have been somewhat challenging. It's like, you know, we, we, you, know I, I, you, you don't need to know all the details about my family, but I can tell you at times, it doesn't always feel as easy <laughs> as I'd like, and I'm not sure what I really want, but I sometimes think that sometimes it's like, just be nice to, you know, maybe even catch a breath. Anyway, I'm, I'm catching a breath this morning by preaching to you. I need a lot of them, all right? But um, here's what Jesus says to the church in Pergamos. He says, I know your works and where you dwell. And this should go up on the screen. Uh, where Satan's throne is. Keep in mind, Jesus is giving a walkthrough assessment of the seven churches that span about 120 miles apart. In between them, there's some distance, but each of them has their own pastor, their own group of people, those who have been led to Jesus Christ, those who've heard about the resurrected Lord, just like you have here in Wareham, and you and I are to learn from these addresses. But Jesus is essentially, with his eyes that are like, a, a, like blazing fire, is assessing the conditions of these seven churches. Some of them have a lot of things that that they need correction on. Some of the things that some of these churches are doing are very commendable, and Jesus commends them. And anyway, so here's in chapter 2, verse 13. He says, I know your works and where you dwell and where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. To the church of Thyatira, he would say, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many, who do, many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, here's Satan showing up again, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And then to the church in Philadelphia, he says, we're going to get there in just a moment and see the full context here. Jesus says, behold, I'm coming quickly. This is unexpectedly. That really, that word means unexpectedly. Uh, We don't know the time and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we know that he's promised to do that. As we looked at last Sunday, the same Jesus, this Jesus who you've seen gone into heaven will come in like manner believe that is actually speaking of his second coming but also we know before the second coming is the rapture because the rapture is the protection of the church before the great and terrible day of the lord known as the great tribulation period that the scripture says will call upon come upon the earth as a final wake-up call to the jewish nation certainly and to anybody who's been left behind There's still opportunity to be saved. It will be much harder. We live in this wonderful age called the age of grace. That's where Jesus Christ is now just offering himself to the world in the gift of salvation. By grace you've been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not a result of works, lest any of you should boast. I had two Jehovah's Witness ladies come to my door on Friday. (laughs) Fun. And... um, It's interesting, I had her read in their New World Translation. If you have a New World Translation, I would strongly discourage you from reading that. 
it is not an accurate translation. It has changed the scripture. They've even admitted. I said, your Bible actually has a lot of errors in it. Yeah, we, we know, but they've been improved. I'm like, <laughs> like basically, it's what she said. You know, we, it's, getting, it's getting better all the time. And, you know, they've adjusted the manuscripts, and then they walk door to door, and it's like, you know, wow. I mean, it's, I hate to say this, but I feel, it's sometimes I wish Christians had the same zeal to bring Jesus to people, but they're bringing a false gospel um, and I looked for an open door, and, um, but I, you know, I really tried to show her that salvation is by grace through faith. And what she said basically, well, you really can't know if you've ever done good enough, is what she said. Well, I know that Jesus did, okay? <laughs> That's what I know, that he did good enough. Whether I fully grasp that in my soul, the magnitude of what his precious blood did for me and cleansed me from all unrighteousness. That's what we're talking about. We talk about this wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. We're talking about a complete and full salvation. My friends, if anybody in this room today is not saved, you please make sure that you ask Jesus Christ to save you before it's too late. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want people to know the grace of God that's been poured out for them. I love the fact that this, I mean, this is one contagious church. I, I, you know, here as me as the pastor, sometimes I have to like, I have to like travel through you guys in that greeting time. I can't penetrate the walls of greeters. Like you're all just grabbing onto each other. And, and that's the sign. And I think that's some of what was going on in the church of Philadelphia. And let's read the text here up on the screen, uh, beginning at verse seven in Revelation chapter three, to, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you because you've kept my command to persevere." I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, Jerus the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name, says Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I believe that even the weakest of us, the weakest of believers, can be strengthened by these messages, by what Jesus says. Pray that as we talk about what he says today would be an encouragement to all of us in these days. But I wanted to make it clear that it seems that Jesus is very, very specific about the addresses where he talks about holding fast where Satan's presence is, is seen. Jesus identifies Satan at work in that region. And just even yesterday, I spoke to somebody who was here at the church and Doro is open to the flea market and just the stuff that can just kind of be on the periphery of our church. It's like, wow, you know, really some ungodly stuff. We share, we share the, the, this um, facility, not this building itself, but you know, we're, we're one of many tenants in this building, and it will be so nice when we finally are able to be on the other property in just a few weeks without the tent, right? Mm -hmm. So get ready. I know a lot of you are getting ready and excited about being at um, the tent, and, and we just pray that as we 
whatever season of ministry we are in at the church, that we never miss an opportunity to be strengthened by Christ himself through his word. And his spirit recognizes that you and I have little strength. Sometimes you have little strength and you say, Lord, I don't know, like, like how? And this is where the Apostle Paul is our best teacher for this moment, teachable moment here. And, I've, and I, you know me, you probably hear a lot of the same scripture come out of this head because I need them, okay? I pray you do too. Um, if you know anything about the thorn in the flesh that reached the life of the Apostle Paul, um, he actually called it a messenger from Satan. And to place him in a state that would probably look to destroy him. I think that's what you have. When Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail, what do you think he's saying there? They're going to try. So as we are here at 3065 Cranberry Highway, whether we eventually, in a few weeks, be at the tent, this is the day to be strengthened for whatever trial that we are, that we are in. And um, so three things I th put there on the back of your, and I do want to share that quick Apostle Paul comment, and then I'll get there. Um, three things that I believe Jesus is, is going to tell this church at Philadelphia. He opens a door that no one can shut. And Jesus makes his purpose clear for his church. And that's something that I think we really want to settle in on today. Um, that's one of those this is one of those biggies that if we stop doing this one, I believe that's going to be seen in point two, um, we're going to lose sight. And that's why there's such health when a church is doing the things that God tells us to do in his word. And number three, Jesus keeps the believer from the great tribulation. But back to that teachable moment for a second by the Apostle Paul. When Paul recognizes that whatever is happening in his life, he recognizes that he's realizing how weak I really am. Jesus refers to this church in Philadelphia as the church that, that you have little strength. You have little strength. So that's good. Actually, I've heard somebody say, I think this is well said, God doesn't um, use the weak, he prefers them. And I think that's a really good way to think about our weakness, our time of need, our time of... It doesn't mean that we're just going to always just, you know, you know just, you know, we're not, we're, we're just going to retreat and do nothing. Well, I'm just so weak, I can't do nothing. That's not the point. It is in my weakness, I'm going to serve Christ. And here's what Paul goes so, he goes so far to say. Christ says to him, uh, my grace is, so, is sufficient for you, for my power is, hear this, made perfect, and that's mature. That's, that's, when you see the word perfect in the scripture, it talks about reaching maturity. How many of us still need to mature? Okay, right here. You, know, you, can, you and I can, I can say a lot up here, but my test is really on the moment I walk off this pulpit and I show up next Sunday. Some of those tests I have passed, and some of them I have failed. Newsflash, <laughs> okay? Just saying. And I like to think, well, I'm always, I'm always so successful. Yeah, right, you know. Um, and I think this is really a, a healthy place for, the, for us to be. Now, I'm not saying we should just always, you know, play the, you know, put up the well, you know, I can't do anything. I'm, I'm defeated. I know of Christians who've, who've been so defeated, they literally, they stop going to church. They have a hard time getting to church. They are being harassed. And again, there are reasons that people take breaks from being in church. So it's no guilt trip here. But there are times where Satan likes to get the believer isolated and into their own head. Especially if your head has been polluted by thoughts that you've not made subject, you've not subjected them to the word of God. This is why we come together. This is the power of learning the scripture. Because we have been, keep this in mind, I love this, that you and I have been, I'm going to switch sides today, boys. Um, 
You and I have been transferred, not that this is the darkness side, but let's just say it was for just a moment. This is the darkness side, and when, when, when we receive Christ, he literally transferred us into another realm, another kingdom, spiritually speaking. There's a tension now that remains in between those two realms that are literally trying to pull at us. This is the old realm that we've been delivered out of. We have been saved from the wrath of God because Jesus did that for me. That's what he did for me. That's why we make a wonderful and a most important deal. It's sort of the Believer Super Bowl is Easter Sunday. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we make sure that Easter is the Super Bowl. It is, it is the championship. It is, the, it is more than that. But it's where we celebrate the hope that you and I have 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 seven, you just however you wanna fill in those gaps. But you and I now are being, we're being pulled in between two tensions. Part of that pull is that old nature in me that doesn't want to trust God, if I can put it so bluntly. You say, well, pastor, that doesn't sound very spiritual, right? <laughs> Paul actually talks about that. He, you know, he was unspiritual. He actually, if you look at the way he delineates Romans chapter 7, that is a powerful picture for every believer. The good I would, I don't do, right? He says, it's no longer I who sin, but it's sin that dwells in me. Well, what is that? Is it always just the impulse to do evil? It might just be the impulse not to trust God. It might be the, the impulse just to use your own ingenuity and try to figure out a different plan. Last night, my son was pretty, well, took ill pretty quickly. And now, you guys know, I don't know how many of you know this, but my son lives with a VP shunt, which is planted right up in between his third and fourth ventricle. And so when that shunt can fail, he can exhibit all types of stuff. He can start throwing up. He can not want to be awake. And so it becomes a concerning time. It's like, well, is this the shunt? Is this the virus? So last night we were able to discern that it wasn't his shunt. But here my brain starts to go in the realm. This is typically an ambulance ride either to Beth Israel and then another ambulance ride to Tufts Medical, whatever it is now. Yeah, it's Tufts. Um, so it's, it's always the whole Boston thing. And, my, you know, and I, so I feel this sense of what, what's this looking like? This is the night before Sunday. Isn't this unusual? <laughs> you know, last few weeks have been sort of things correspond. And I told my wife yesterday, I said, you know, Saturdays have really become a hard day. <laughs> Just saying. Um, but I also know that it is my obligation before the Lord is to heed the counsel of these addresses that Jesus is giving to the churches uh, throughout the book of Revelation. The scripture says that Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. But there's a war on. And as you and I recognize that, and so that we could actually say, Lord, in this time of my You've just made it so clear. I'm weak, okay? I'm going to let this weakness be strengthened by you, Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God that you have given to me. The Bible says that when I called upon Jesus, this is what happened. The Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, came to indwell this person. And guess what he also did? He sealed me for the day of redemption. You're looking at a sealed vessel up here this morning. Okay. Sealed because of what Jesus did for me. A lot of times a believer is not going to feel very sealed. But this is how you train your mind in the word of God so that you are not blown off course. I have listened to some very good pastors over this last six, eight weeks, trying to fill up my own head with more content on the book of Revelation, and for the pastors who seem to be committed to giving their church a full picture of the blessed hope, those churches seem to come under attack. So you are no threat to Satan if you don't preach the gospel, 
if you don't hold fast to the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin, that you know he's risen again and you know he's coming again and with his coming again is a complete detailed agenda that's coming forth in the book of the Revelation. I like what these two commentators say regarding some of the early uh, you know, verses here in, in Revelation chapter 3 beginning at verse 7. John Walvoord, who's a trusted Bible uh, commentator, has been the editor of t- two wonderful commentaries, volume one and two. He says, the city, Philadelphia, was named for a king of Pergamum, Adelus Philadelphius. Philadelphius is a s- similar to the Greek word Philadelphia, meaning brotherly love. Interesting that, believe that actually this city was built for his brother, so it was like brotherly love was going on here. I'm building this city for my, my little bro or whatever it is. And so, but anyway, isn't it interesting that the very thing that Jesus communicates to this address, I just want you to know something. Jesus can always make good come out of bad. Even when there is something going on in our life that we don't like, if we would just wait prayerfully long enough, we may indeed see What Satan meant for evil, God has used for good. And I believe that's what's happening here in the book of Revelation, which occurs seven times in the Bible, this idea of brotherly love. Paul mentions it in Romans. He mentions it in 2 Thessalonians. He mentions it in other places. But the same meaning, this brotherly love, uh, which occurs seven times in the Bible, only here it's used of the city itself. Um, Christian testimony continues in the city in this present century. Isn't that interesting? Because they haven't lost their love for Jesus Christ. Christ described himself as one of the one who's holy and true. This is so helpful here. Who holds the key of David and who's able to open or shut a door which no one else could open or shut. The holiness of Christ is a frequent truth in the scripture, 1 Peter 1.15. And being holy, he is worthy to judge the spiritual life of the Philadelphia church. Jesus' evaluations of your life and mine can be fully trusted. And he wants best for you. Don't ever forget that. Whatever correction he brings into my life, and I've said this to my son many times, Aaron, take the correction. (laughs) And Jesus says to me, Dave, take the correction, okay? But I want you to not miss this. The key of David seems to refer to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, where the key of the house of David was given to Eliakim, who then had access to all the wealth of the king. Christ earlier has been described as the one who holds the keys of death in Hades. The reference, however, here, however, seems to be spiritual treasures. Christ has all the treasures that you need to succeed not just materially, but I mean spiritually speaking. The real growth that we want is this inner man, this new man that Jesus says uh, at the end of this address, I'm going to give you a new name. He names new people. (laughs) Christ has a new name for us. The old is gone and the new has come. And for us to actually... um, experience him that's what really this life is about as a believer is some of us just need to really dump our baggage and let jesus fill that with himself a lot of us a lot of stuff comes downstream i mean i don't know how many of you've been influenced by jehovah's witnesses but i bet some of you certainly have and you've picked up stuff that's come downstream you've some of you been raised in roman catholicism You've picked up stuff that came downstream. 
Some of you have been raised in liberal churches and you picked up stuff that has come downstream. Some of you are so committed to following political agendas that you've picked up stuff that comes downstream. And then you form this thing, which many would call that that's your worldview. And a lot of times you now you're hearing Bible teaching and let the scripture set you straight. If somehow in your life and mind that we're just saying, I'm not giving that one up. I'm not giving that mental stronghold up. You are in danger, my friend. That's not to say you're in danger of hell, but you certainly are in danger of not growing in Christ, as you should. If Jesus has all the treasures for you, that's referenced here, that this key of David, that he's giving to this church, that they would open up the scriptures and behold the master himself then you and I consistently should say, Lord, open up so that I could experience the wealth of your treasury. Charles Spurgeon put a uh, wonderful set in the Psalms called the Treasury of David. It looks at the Psalms and the richness of the Psalms. And so anyway, but sometimes we need to realize that there is a, a pathway, a provision that God has given to us to grow and he wants us to take that pathway and he gives that to each of these churches here's a specific pathway for you church at Thyatira here's a specific pathway that I'm showing you in other words I'm calling you back to where you need to be I'm showing you what's wrong here I'm going to affirm you where you're strong but I'm also going to tell you to in three of these addresses to hold fast you grab those bars those bars name are Jesus. <laughs> okay, hold fast. Here's another one I'd like to read. Uh, this is going to come up on the screen. Um, this is the book by Amir uh, Sefarti, who wrote that book on revealing revelation. There's two copies left available today if you haven't had a chance to pick them up. This is really speaking to the present hour that you and I are living in. The doorway that Revelation chapter 3 verse 7 is talking about is a wide open door for the church at Philadelphia because of its location. This church was at the entrance to the kingdom of Lydia, Mysia in Phrygia. Any merchants traveling to and from these locations had to pass through the city. This gave the church at Philadelphia a great opportunity to reach many people across the Roman Empire with the gospel. See, that's what God is doing right now, church. He's calling sinners to be saved. He's calling people to believe the finished work of himself for you. Isn't that amazing? If Aaron was here this morning, he would have told you that uh, we love him because he first loved us. The cross is the proof that you can't earn it. What you can do is take it. Amen? It's called receiving it. The door for evangelism was wide open for them, and the Philadelphians were making great use of it. Many believe that this particular address references the great missionary movement over the centuries. America had a great missionary opportunity in the 19th and 20th century, and it seems that that, I'm not saying that the door isn't still open, but it seems like that door is becoming less opened. I think you have less missionaries going. Uh, we used to have like, send out, you know, Barbara and Joe, and they're going to go to China, and they're, they're going to go to the, you know, parts of Asia. And yet, you know, we, we do, our church does support some missionaries and their work, and we uh, do our best to pray for them every Wednesday night and ask the Lord to bless them. But it also, I believe, means that the local church itself isn't just about you know, us just funding missionary endeavors. We can certainly do that. But one of the blessings of the open door is that this local church has an open door. Um, somebody said to me they know our church because of that place called the Church at the Tent. You know, Matter of fact, the Jehovah's Witness lady told me, after she finds that I'm a pastor, says, oh yeah, I've driven by there. I'm like, you should come. <laughs> You know, so this door for evangelism was wide open for them and the, and, and the Philadelphians were making great use of it. This should be the prayer of all of us today. Lord, open a door of opportunity for me to love others and share the truth 
of your gospel. You know, I'm all on board with loving people. I think it's great. Woman called this morning. I don't know if she's here. If you're here, I'm welcome. Um, but, you know, I need a gift card. I'm like, okay, well, I can't do that right now. I'm getting ready for church. I said, why don't you come to church? My thought is you get to get the real food, okay? Gift cards are great, but we're not just like the gift card church, like just give out the gift cards, you know? What we are is if we give out gift cards, we also want to make sure that they know about Jesus Christ, right? You know, let's, let's, let's teach them about the real food that they could have in Christ. Now, again, I know that's a process. People like, I, you know, maybe after the third time that a church reaches out to somebody, and I've had people who still pick us up on the Thanksgiving dinner. It's like, oh, you're the church that does the dinner. You doing the dinner this year? Yeah. And we try to do things. We try to do little concerts in here or whatever we do. We try to make sure that the, there's a gospel witness with every meal. And it's amazing. And so you were, we got open doors here at Grace Lighthouse Church. We have open doors and we don't want to lose sight of that. No matter how rough the times get in our church, in our lives, and sometimes it's all that Satan can do, he wants to do, he wants to neutralize us. I've, I shared last Sunday, 1 Peter 5, 8, that uh, Satan roams the earth seeking whom he may devour. Guess what I believe devour really means? Neutralize. Yeah, you may be walking around, but are you loving Jesus? Have you learned to love him? I'm telling you, with every breath I have in me, do not ever forget that he loved you first. He loved you you first and he proved it with his life and now he says I want it personalized in you I want you to know the, the depths of this love the majority of the earth's population have no awareness that Jesus will return one day there's a few of us who know that praise God Jesus isn't keeping us in the dark he wants us not to be caught off guard when you see the word used here called quickly, it means unexpectedly, suddenly. You can't say, oh, it's on this date because XYZ's happened and you got the CBDC and all the currencies and everything's emerging and you, know, you got this convergence of... Again, I, I, listen, I'm paying attention to that stuff too. But it's like, well, because all that happened, then that automatically means the rapture's happened like next day. You just don't do that stuff. We just can't do that. What we can do is say, wow, it seems certainly like things are setting up. For a one world government under the person of the Antichrist who has come to, re to take the place of Jesus Christ and offer a false gospel to the world of being saved during that time. And God will allow his wrath to be poured out to get the earth's attention one last time while well, there is a massive revival occurring in that hour. Many people will get saved, but many people will give up their lives because they've actually believed the truth of the gospel during the most heightened time upon the earth. You and I have got it good, and we've got an open door. Verse 9, Jesus makes his purpose clear to his church. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. Paul calls the true Jew in one sense a one who's received the Savior, who's believed on Jesus Christ. He says this in the, in the book of Philippians. We are of the true circumcision. That means that our flesh nature has been cut away and we have received a new nature by our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit and now we are no longer people and again we're the Gentile group and I still fully believe God has a full purpose for the nation of Israel let it go on record that this pastor is not ever going to submit to anti-semitic thinking amen I am going to hold fast that God still has a plan and he loves the Jewish people. But those who had a false sense of righteousness, they were enemies of God. A Jew who still holds Jesus Christ you know, away from them, they're an enemy. You and I were once enemies. Let's just put it that way. Every person who does not bow their knee to Jesus Christ, God views them as his enemy because he's made a full provision of reconciliation and he wants those people to know him. God loves his enemies. Don't 
don't, don't hear that any different. God loves to save people. He loves to save his enemies. Who say they are Jews and are not. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. I love the way John Moffat I said, you seem like you're reading the sermon notes. Uh, in Philippians, Paul would say, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are going to be those who are worshiping Jesus someday face to face. Our, every, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. I like to believe that we as Christians have already bowed our knee and we have already said we've confessed you as Lord. Jesus, you are the Lord and we know you. And so I believe this is a picture of the coming judgment where everybody will be there and that we ourselves, we will be saved, but every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. And here's what God says here uh, through Christ, and to know that I've loved you. One of the dangers for the church is that they don't keep themselves in the love of God. Jude said that. And you realize so many of the, of the, of the most potent teaching in the scripture when it comes to protecting yourself is the letters that deal with false teaching. <laughs> if you look at Jude, that's like, that, that's got, Jude's got war paint on. He's ready, to, he's ready to defend. There's, a peop, there's, a, there's just corruption, doctrinal corruption that hits people. I was trying to be so gracious with these two, two, two Jehovah's Witnesses the other day. One was like a really sweet looking young lady and the other one, like she looked a little tougher. But needless to say, I'm like, I can't be like really rude because I don't want to lose them. I'm thinking maybe there's some kindness here that I could just appeal to them. And finally I said, can you hang out right here for a second? I want to go look up a book. And I want you to read this and it's answering uh, Jehovah's Witness verse by verse by uh, Dave Reed. I don't have the book. I ordered. I like went right and ordered it immediately. I, I'm like hoping like they could wait for Amazon Prime to show up the next day, <laughs> but they didn't. They actually walked away before I got back, and I'm thinking, Lord, maybe they'll come back and I'll be more prepared. But needless to say, um, you know, you just want to be ready for open doors, even if the cults come knocking on your door. Okay, that's how good this this our preparation should be. Is that our you know Paul. Peter said, always be ready to give an answer, um, you know, always be ready to give an answer of the reason of the hope that is within you with gentleness and respect. You don't have to be a jerky Christian <laughs> to give the gospel. You just don't have to be rude about it, you know. I love Jesus, he died for me, and I want you to know the same thing. I want you to know he loves you too. Matter of fact, he loves his enemies. You call me an enemy? No, it's like a story I tell you guys. I know what I'm going on here. I love Rob, who runs the sign company out here. And I said, one day, he's like, look at the day the Lord has made. I said, I said, Rob, he lets his sun shine on the righteous and the wicked. He says, are we wicked? I said, I can tell you how to become righteous. <laughs> <laughs> and right there at the top of his lungs, he calls on Jesus. I told him what to do. Again, God knows his heart, but I love him, and I, wanted him, I want him to know the gospel. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. I'm going to just kind of get to the wrap-up here. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. Do you hear that? A true child of God is not just somebody who's been created in the image of God. A lot of people are like, we're all children of God. No, nope, we're not. We're not bragging about this. I mean, Paul says he would boast about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that made him a child of God. But a child of God is somebody who's done right with Jesus. They've been born again. They are a true child of God. They know Christ. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not been yet revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, rapture, Rapture alert here. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Believer, how do you keep yourself pure? You keep yourself in the love of Christ. That's what you do. You just look in that mirror and you say, Jesus, I don't deserve it, but you sure do love me and you're not quitting on me are you he's like i'm not quitting on you i'll never quit on you that's awesome stuff jesus keeps the believer from the great tribulation verse 10 through 13 
because you've kept my commandment to persevere. And that's just that's holding fast. We're holding on to him. I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall call, come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from, from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Philadelphia was one of those earth uh, quake prone regions. The city had been destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt. And they can see these temples, these big, huge columns, you know, these pillars that are now crumbled, names on it, so-and-so, God, and it's crumbled. And Jesus is saying, in me are pillars that last forever. I am the firm foundation, right? So what Jesus is giving a picture of is the stability of the believer for all eternity. And God will provide rewards for those who remain faithful to him. My friend, Jesus even works with weak faith. So don't think, you've got to start with where you're at. I have to start with where I'm at. If you're like, oh, I like, like studying William Carey and all these great missionaries, and like, look what these people did. Well, if you want to become a William Carey, start praying every day. You want to become somebody who's useful for God, start getting in your Bible every day. You want to become a great witnesser, share Jesus wherever God puts you, start asking God for open doors. God is not looking for you to be something that you're not. What he's willing to do is build you where you are at. And then to begin for you to begin to see that the open door that he's given to you could be greatly used here at Grace Lighthouse Church. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. Thank you that you are able to help us in our time of great need. I thank you for this wonderful address to the Church of Philadelphia that Jesus says, because of your faithfulness, I will keep you from the hour of testing that's coming upon the whole earth, Lord. Father, for those who are here that may be just feeling that sense of weakness or struggle or that just, it just doesn't seem to be happening today, Father, I would pray for them that you would strengthen them, that in their own way right now, Lord, they would call upon you right where they're at, they would call upon you. Jesus, work in me. Empower me for what you want. Show me how to keep my mind on you and to keep myself in your love that I will never forget that I love you because you first loved me. And I just pray for you right now, you who are willing to say, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me. There were many in the scripture who said to Jesus, help me. So I'm praying, Lord, for all of us this morning that we would not be afraid to pray that prayer. We also ask you, Father, to continue to open our eyes to recognize the open doors that you've given to this church. Thank you for all that you've done here. Thank you for this wonderful worship team that's growing and singing your praises. I pray for them, Lord, that you'd strengthen and protect them. Thank you that they want to declare your praise each week, Lord, and I pray whatever's going on in their own families right now, hard-pressed on all sides, as the apostle says, but we're not in despair. So I pray, Lord, for my church that you would strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen us who serve, strengthen us who teach, strengthen us who have stuff going on at home. Pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would just be the, the brightness of our day. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Thank you, Lord. We know that your arrival is soon. You're, you said I'll come quickly, unexpectedly. 
but this is how you get ready for me. Love me. Just keep loving me. I will show you things. I will open up the treasury. I will show you what is yours. So we're keeping ourselves in this love and we're keeping ourselves pure as we see the day approaching. And we thank you so much, Father. And Father, for anybody not saved in this building, on the live stream, that this would be the day that they say, Jesus, I call upon you to save me from my sins. That your payment on that cross was my payment and I receive it into my life right now. No questions asked. This is my day of salvation, as the scripture says. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. May the Lord bless you for trusting him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Again, if you want to talk, 